It's the most wonderful time of the year. When the hype train starts rolling and cell arts are going, hey, BlizzCon is here. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the most rumor filled card in a while. There's the Yabo for soon, and the Shadow Let's Boom, and the Death Legs Breathe Fire. It's the most rumor filled card in a while. There'll be protesters protesting, streamers playtesting, and waiting to see what's in store. While the internet watches for roasting and trolling of Jay and Ian and more. It's the most wonderful time of the year. When the memes come and go, when the developers know if they bought their career. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Hey, it's Sol, and welcome back to another episode of Warcraft Weekly, the show that takes all the polarizing news of the world of Warcraft and turns it into just another week of news. Woo! This and every show is brought to you by our beautiful sponsors somewhere up there. Ooh, look at that pretty new ticker, and your name could be up here too. We got a few newcomers joining our fun little faction. Let's give a warm welcome to David, Miyaka, or maybe it's Miyasa, and Duck. Hey, my name is Duck, and I like to party. We are now one week away from BlizzCon 2019, where the weekly is going to take a break. Oh my god, we're actually not going to have a show next week in favor of liquor, chicken and waffles, partying. Running from protesters, waiting for the next edgelord on a bike. Oh, and, and, and BlizzCon, yeah, convention stuff, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> Let's get to some news, okay? Over on the classic side of WoW, more realms have been judged as worthy, or at least at a healthy enough population to finally turn off layering. Four realms in the EU region and a whopping 17 realms in the US are now considered normal, with more or less normal cues. Tell that to this guy though. One of the top comments on the US thread reads this. Could you guys maybe, just maybe, give us a little bit of a heads up next time to, you know, so people don't get stuck in an hour long queue and miss their raids? It honestly feels like you guys are spiting in our faces for supporting your game for over 15 years. To which the actual top comment on the thread reads, Lol, calm down, Turbo Nerd. So you were 20 minutes late to Molten Boar. Big deal. <laughs> Turbo Nerd, I, I just found that humorous. <laughs> Shut up, Turbo Nerd. Aww. Obviously, fewer realms on the EU side had their layering shut off. Because they're the true classic audience. Well, you know, that might not be so inaccurate. Blizzard also opened up a new German realm with a German language preference. Here's what's really interesting though. With this new realm, this brings the total number of German realms to... 9. Actually, so it's at 10. Could you, could you not fact check me please? It's sort of interesting that on the US side of things, only seven realms are still using at most two layers to operate, according to these statements that were made by Blizzard. Meanwhile, 25 realms on the EU side are still using layers. So what do you think this is? I don't have any really educated guesses aside from like maybe math, but I'd like to hear what you think. And bonus points if you can think of reasons without talking down or overgeneralizing an entire region's worth of people. Good luck. This week, with a simple blog post, the Recruiter Friend feature was finally implemented, just in time to make sure that all of your WoW Classic friends disqualified themselves from being a potential recruit. I know that there were earlier blog posts to help get more visibility on this, but you know, I figured that there would be a little bit more. So I decided to help a little bit with the promoting. Oh God, no. Hello, you sitting at your desk or on the toilet. Are you ready for subscription independence? I'm going to tell you how to fire your boss and take control of your life with my program, The Recruiter Friend System. You will not be going door to door, calling randos over the phone, or sending creepy requests over Facebook. Tell the people at your job, F you. I am going to play the World of Warcraft for free. All you need to do, pal, is find a few friends, loved ones, family members, co-workers, ex-co-workers, etc. and ask them one thing. 
Hey, can you help me out, man? That's called warm calling in the entrepreneurial world. You only need help from three people. Three means free. And get them into being your World of Warcraft recruits through any possible means. Begging, guilt, or a favor. Then, tell each of your new recruits to get three of their own recruits so they too can achieve subscription independence. Strengthen your downline, be your own boss, and one day you'll make it, just like me, with a sweet ride, cool threads, and your own monkey. <laughs> yep, nailed it. I mentioned earlier in this video, as well as, well, many, many other videos, that BlizzCon is coming soon. Real soon. Like, like, this is it. The moment that we've been waiting for. The map is out, the schedule is looking pretty mysterious, and rounding out this year's closing festivities is whatever the heck image I put out here in post-production. That's right, folks. Placeholder Musical Guest is going to be joining us for uh, the BlizzCon closing ceremonies. I am absolutely stoked to see these one through five people performing. And I'm sure this is going to excite at least a third of you, and another third of you are going to absolutely hate it. And here is my cad sarcastic comment. So this is it, folks, with placeholder rounding out the closing ceremonies. This is going to be your BlizzCon. What do you think? As for me, though, I think I'm prepared. I took those 50 questions that I had and whittled them down to like kind of a top 20-ish questions that I'm going to try to ask if I get the chance. And I want to emphasize that if, like... If. And I already packed up a bunch of my stuff next week, including my bear colored shirt and mask, so I can easily blend in with the crowd as soon as the violence breaks out. I am absolutely kidding though. This leads me to this week's What of the Week, where I poke at the proverbial bear and hope that they don't notice. Earlier this week, Jeremy Hambly, who runs the channel The Quartering, posted a video accusing Blizzard of censorship. The tweet reads as the following. New video, the effing cowards at Blizzard canceled the live Q&A at BlizzCon to protect their delicate feelings. I wonder who asked them to do that. I am sure, quote, China in no way influenced their decision, end quote, complete cowards. Make sure you watch and share far. What? The comments on the video, as well as the tweets, included the typical bandwagoning of yeah, Blizzard sucks, they're pro-China, pro-censorship, whatever, and unironically, nothing about Hong Kong current events, which I'm not going to talk about here because it's politics. I mean, imagine if I did. Hey Bob, what do you think of the Hong Kong government formally withdrawing their controversial extradition bill that started these protests in the- Hey look at this meme. It's me. I'm on the train. And I've got a hot date with me. Yeah, okay. But let's turn this back around. This What of the Week is not about politics. It's not even about attacking or defending Blizzard's behavior in this controversy. It's just about... It's just about being so wrong about the reporting. Spreading misinformation as news is a very dangerous game, thanks to social media being uh, mostly, what's the word, laissez-faire? And if you have a big audience, you can get the word out very quickly before even being compelled to make some correction. For example, I do news and commentary, and last week I messed up. I said that Bolvar said, oh, there must always be a Lich King, when it was actually King Terranus, Arthas's father, who said uh, that there must always be a Lich King. So, oops, my bad. But in the greater context of things, that's really small potatoes. On the other side, though, let me run this clip. What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from The Quartering, and Blizzard actually did it. The absolute cowards canceled Q&A at BlizzCon in a nefarious way now i've been watching the blizzcon schedule pretty closely over the past few days and talking with my insiders as well as people like mark kern that was just the first 20 seconds of the video now i can take the rest of this 11 minute and 45 second video and dismantle it turn it into oh turn this rant into just kind of a mess of keywords and emotional draws with the singular purpose of keeping viewers engaged with their emotions and their rooted fears and not actually educating them but that's not really my thing i don't do that or at least I don't do it well. Fortunately though, peppered within the responses and comments have been those who sought to correct some of the misinformation in the video. So to be clear, there's always been like a big wow Q&A. Now, whenever there have been new IPs like Overwatch and Hearthstone, they've had like one big Q&A and that's because those games were new. The big wow Q&A, that's been like a yearly thing over at BlizzCon. The more famous Q&A questions, like the ones that came from the red shirt guys, those came in kind of like that short 10 minute gap or so that uh, comes following the end of a normal uh, panel feature. One notable moment from the big Q&A is when Jay Allen did his whole you think you do but you don't thing, which is obviously what propelled him to become the 
big Blizzard boss today. So we have this guy to thank for it. Also, for several years now, the Q&A has been curated in some way, shape or form. If you're one of those people who get in line to ask a question, you're asked by the moderator, hey, what's your question? And then you're allowed to go up. The Big Wild Q&As are even more curated. We write down our questions, we uh, put it into a box, and we just hope for the best, or otherwise they just fall into the ether. They also take questions from the forums and Twitter as well, reducing further hope that people who are there at the convention are going to get their question asked. But obviously, Jeremy, who I'm sure does fantastic work, should probably not listen to these so-called Blizzard insiders he's talking about. Fortunately, there is a happy ending. There was a second video released retracting the statement and going on to clarify just how it is the Q&A format at BlizzCon operate. I'm sure that this information was gathered by the tried and true method of asking around. The moral of the story is this. Having some sort of reporting agenda, it's not really against the law. In fact, in the United States, it's protected to a certain degree. Being the kind of content creator who peddles anger and rage is a business model for news and entertainment. There's nothing wrong with that either. But basing it on information that is demonstrably false? Like, what? Oh, and on a final note, the original video? Well, that's still up. Still getting views, ads, and so on. Of course, this wouldn't be a weekly without an 8.3 PTR build to talk about, and this is the build that many were hoping and dreading for. For one thing, there were three Death Knight swords introduced. Three more swords were added, which now introduces the idea of an additional allied race. This is it, folks. Here it is, the Abomination. You think I'm wrong, huh? Pfft. But that third arm can't just be left alone. That's, you know, that's kind of messed up. But you're here for whatever it is that I put on the thumbnail, right? This build introduced the system that Ian has a hard-on for RNG teased in the initial 8.3 reveal. I covered this replacement system in a video that I posted earlier this week. If you haven't seen it yet, I strongly recommend spending the extra couple minutes familiarizing yourself with it, and then come back for some updates on more recent developments. But let me summarize really quick. In a nutshell, item levels are going to stabilize in 8.3. Titan forging and war forging is dead. In its place is a stats called corruption, and at least as of this current build, it has a chance to appear on gear that drops. Corruption benefits are known as a kiss-curse mechanic, where the more benefits that you want, the higher your corruption is, which results in these occasional snares, personal mechanics, and additional damage taken. When I tested this, it was painfully easy to understand the spirit of what Blizzard intends to do here, and yet the confusion among fans has been absolutely mind-boggling. It's as if they took the most polarizing comments as a gospel and ran with it. It even took WoWhead three posts across half a day to cover the system. So today I'm going to clarify a few things while including some recently learned information. This might not calm your butt, but at the very least you're going to be presented with the facts. If you're not happy with this system, in a way you can pretty much opt out. If you happen to get any corrupted gear, you can cleanse it. According to Ian, you can do this without restriction other than, well, having to go and get it cleansed. You can call it inconvenient, I might call it roleplay, but we're both right. This fact alone probably dispels like 80% of the arguments out there, with the biggest among them being, well, players just want Titanforging to go away, Blizz, just, just do that, and they don't want anything to take its place. So that's cool, we can opt to wash our problems away. It's just kind of funny though, we're... <laughs> We're literally running to Mother to cleanse our gear. With no more Warforging or Titanforging, the best gear is still going to come from the hardest level content that you can handle. Unlike Titanforging, corruption isn't a thing that you're just trying to stack. In fact, it's a challenge to your personal responsibility. Do you really want to risk standing in a big old void zone during a raid or a dungeon encounter when you need to make really precise movements? Yes because by beaters. The corruption perks are also not slot restricted, which is something that a lot of critics are, are severely overlooking. If you want a lot of leech, for example, leech isn't just tied to your weapon, it can drop anywhere. So you don't have to wait for the exact item to drop that has that perk you really want. Also, corruption is going to happen everywhere, not just raids, as I was led to believe. You might get corrupted gear from PvP, Mythic Plus, and I'm going to presume uh, world quests and emissaries as well. Finally, the legendary cloak is also going to add corruption resistance as you upgrade it. So the earlier predictions that your Mythic Plus cape might outperform your legendary cloak, well, that's out the window. I was going to leave a critique about the relationship between corruption values and the perks, a very handsome person over on Twitter, though, voiced their concern about this and only minutes later was answered by Ian himself. 
So whether you notice this or not, in a future build, corruption is going to have a fixed value. Corruption buffs have three tiers, which are pretty easy to understand, but each tier comes with a corruption that has this range, a variance of five. If this was left alone, this would have really adverse effects on player behavior. It would encourage them to keep farming, to roll for the lowest corruption values, and then stack as many of these bonuses as possible. But who cares? It's no longer going to be a thing. We just need to find out what these values are going to be. So let's thank the hero who brought this up, because otherwise, this would absolutely not have been brought up by anybody. Oh, shush. All right, fine. So there's still the unanswered question, at least as of this recording, of what's going to come out of that weekly Mythic Plus chest? So far, at least, it doesn't appear that a plus 10 is going to drop Mythic level gear, but we're just going to have to wait and see um, what they announce. No, we're not. We're going to come to our own conclusions and raise heck at BlizzCon. I think you're right. Well, I guess that's the show then. Next week is going to be really skimpy on the content because I'm going to leave town. I'm going to be doing the BlizzCon coverage and all that stuff. So make sure that you're following me over on Twitter and Discord, especially after open ceremonies when all the crazy announcements happen. I'll be taking a look at my feeds to see if there are any questions that you might have on whatever the heck it is that they announce. And if there's a chance for me to get answers, I will. If I haven't made it painfully obvious already, I'm going to be going to BlizzCon as a media type person, and I have you to thank. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, but, but I have all of you to thank as well. A big thanks to... Well, all your support and your donations, the questions, even the doubt, you know, those things just help me It help push me to do better with as little effort as possible. Haha. <laughs> You're probably not going to believe me if I say that I'm like a really bashful person, although I am. Uh, but I want to meet you. So if you happen to see me on the show floor, you know, go ahead and stop me. Come in and say hi, take a selfie, uh, have a chat. Uh, maybe we'll have a drink. You'll pay. Or, if you're like from far away, you can be like, hey, you, and then I'll look over and you'll be like, and I'll be like, that would be pretty cool too. Real talk though, I'm anxious, I'm a little bit nervous, um, it, it's, a, it's a lot to prepare for, um, and there's been, you know, there are all sorts of things that we could and should be worrying about, and I'm trying not to. Um, and I'm trying to stick uh, the context of BlizzCon to the gaming and just the celebration of of, of, of Blizzard and all these things that we like talking about. But it's being canceled out by the excitement, just the wonder, the uh, just the chance to be surrounded by that sort of energy uh, that overcomes any of that, any of that nervousness, the speculation and the rumors and like the early leaks. Uh, it, it's it's going to be nuts the days leading up to BlizzCon. And unfortunately, I probably won't be able to cover them. Um, but beyond all that stuff, when Friday rolls around and we all sit down, you know, I'll sit with my wife and I'll be surrounded by friends and guildmates. Um, a big part of me is going to be, <clears throat> a big part of me is going to shut down. Like the commentator, the analyst, all that stuff, at least for a moment, is going to go away for like an hour or so. And then I'll just be a fan. I'll be one of those screaming for the Horde fans, um, jumping out of my seat, uh, at the, just sitting at the edge of my seat eager to see whatever the heck it is that Blizzard is going to show us. BlizzCon 2017 was massive. It was huge. It was memorable with the announcement of Battle for Azeroth and Classic WoW all in the same shot. But this year we're celebrating 25 years of Warcraft. This is going to be the 15th BlizzCon, if I'm recalling correctly. So <laughs> this is it, guys. Next week, join me. Strap in, we're gonna go for a ride on the emotional roller coaster. It's gonna be a hell of a time, especially because the biggest panels on the first day are going to be free. So you can watch that stuff live. And once that's done, you can immediately go to YouTube because Barry Light already put out videos for each one. For now though, let's get out of here. In less than a week, I'm gonna be at BlizzCon surrounded by <laughs> who knows what. So I wanna thank all of you for coming. Please like the video if you enjoyed yourself. Subscribe for more of this and all things Warcraft. Uh, consider becoming a fellow supporter or a patron or whatever, or don't. I'm just happy that you made it to the end, too. As I said earlier, Warcraft Weekly is going to be on a break next week, but stay tuned for plenty of BlizzCon coverage. Until then, folks, stay safe, stay happy, and stay breezy.